You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody, my global family. Truly, truly appreciate all of you. Thank you for doing this again and again and again with me. It's an honor to have all of you here again today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, from wherever you're joining me from. Thank you. I love to read your comments. I'm so, so grateful to all of you. May the Lord comfort you. I see you. I read. That's one of the reasons why I read. I know what it means to lose a father. The Lord shall comfort you in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Good evening, all of you. This period, it's important for us to show more kindness, more love to people because people are going through so much. I mean so so much. May the Lord comfort every one of you that need comfort. May the Lord bless you. May, the, may He do you good in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Tonight I'd like you to know that in my opening remark, every storm runs out of rain. I'm going to repeat myself. God bless you. I see where you're joining me from. Every storm runs out of rain. Every storm runs out of rain. Every problem has an expiry date. Therefore, please don't give up. It may look as if, God, where are you? I prayed, I fasted. What's going on? God comes late when he wants to come big. He's walking behind the scene, and you may not know yet. We may not understand, but God is doing something. Oh, God bless you. I'm reading. Yes, thank you so very much, my American daughter. Every storm runs out of rain. No storm lasts forever, but we last. We last. We've been through storms. I've been through storms, different kinds of storms, just like so many of you too. We've been through storms, but see, we're still here. We're still here. So please, that's my opening remark tonight. Every storm runs out of rain and every problem has an expiry date. Thank you. I'm going to be coming to London. I'll be coming to, okay, to Uganda. I'll be coming very soon to Houston. I'll let you know. <laughs> you know, you see it on my post. Tonight, I want to welcome you. Please invite your friends and everyone that is very important to you. Let's do this together again. I have a very, very special guest tonight. A very seasoned man. Very balanced, you know. <laughs> He's seen it all too. He's a minister of the gospel. He's in business. He's married. He's a father. He's a mentor to so many people. And he's going to be a huge blessing to us tonight i am so grateful that he agreed to do this um, with me yes, yes every problem has an experience. hello, hello good evening ma it's an honor to be here with you <laughs> It's such an honor to have you here, and I feel so, so, so good tonight because I know we're going to be impacted, we're going to be corrected, we're going to be challenged, we're going to be inspired. We thank God for the gift of God that you are. And I'm going to ask Reverend Olumide Emmanuel to pray with you. I see all your prayer requests, everyone. When we are rounding off, okay, Kigali, with my husband and I just came back. Thank you. Uh, you know? I'm going to ask you to pray, so please don't be distracted with your prayer time. Thank you. Come again. To my eyes, our Bishop, Bishop Dewey and the family. Yes, thank God. Yeah, we're, we're good. Very well. And yours? We are in the, we're enjoying the grace of God. <laughs> and that grace is very, very yeah. sufficient for all of us. Okay. Like, um, you know, this navigate with FFA, just like the name navigate you know god gives you the privilege of bringing people of this particular show people that are at the top 
in their various capacities and callings and gifts and skills, or the people that are on their way there, people that have testimony. Because we know that success doesn't just happen suddenly. And I tell them to please pull the curtains back and be vulnerable enough to share with us. Some of us might be going through one struggle or another, and then we're thinking, I'm a Christian or I'm a Muslim, because this program is not just for Christians. Muslims also reach out to us, people of different faith. And God is not <laughs> hearing my prayer or what's going on. But the little people like you, they are encouraged. And those that need correction, you know, and all that. So please, a man of God, can you just tell my viewers a bit? about yourself and your background before you became famous before you got married before you became a, a business tycoon a multi-millionaire before you became any of these things who is this? wow thank you very much for having me on this program i want to begin by thanking god for your life for your family and for your impact in the body of christ you have been a great role model a great inspiration a great trailblazer and we're grateful to God for what God is doing and will continue to do through your life. Um, when you went back to school recently to go and study law, um, you, you shattered another table. <laughs> and um, we are so grateful to God for your continual hunger to be the best version of yourself. And we also pray that the Lord will continually keep you for us. Well, my name is Olumi De Oladapo Ibanwell. Uh, I was born uh, on the 20th of May, 1970, uh, as the firstborn of uh, my parents. Uh, so I'm the firstborn of five plus two. Five plus two adopted children, so seven altogether. Grew up in a middle-class family. My father was uh, a custom officer. My mom started out as a nurse, uh, ended up in catering and cooking, and I went to school like every other person. We, we grew up in what we call the Cherubim and Seraphim, you know, White Garment Church. That's where we all grew up. And um, I had an encounter with God. I became born again as a teenager in the 80s when I was in school, uh, Federal Polytechnic in Ilaro. That's where I met with God. And um, I studied building technology and quantity surveying um, in Federal Polytechnic in Ilaro. And um, that's where I met with God. Well, my encounter with God is a different ball game. You know, when I got to school, um, a lot of people um, in those days used to say things like, um, oh, there is no God, or when I grow old, it's when you grow old, you now retire into Christianity, and all those. So we have all kinds of school of thoughts. And I was one of such people that at the back of my mind, probably because of uh, uh, some of the things I've seen, I believed there was God, and I just felt that at the appointed time, not as a young boy like this, you now see you are serving God. When we grow old, after we have made money, we go and serve God. But that was not to be because um, I had an encounter with God in 1988, and that encounter was what brought me into salvation. I, in the school where I was in the Laro, we have those that lived on campus, and we have those that live off campus. And I was one of those that lived off campus. And um, I live off campus, so it's like room, different rooms. And as I said, then oh, we're doing, even though we're teenagers, we're partying, women. Sometimes I look back now, I'm like, are you guys all as a teenager? What kind of party were you even doing with your life, you know? And then one day, there is this guy, he's a Christian. They normally do what I can now look back and call fellowship. People normally gather in his room, maybe once a week, they do those stuff, just watch all these Jesus people. And then one of such days, I was coming back and I saw a group of people in his room and I was like, what are these people talking about again? So I just stopped to hear what they were saying. And the sentence I heard was like, you need to understand that the Antichrist is going to come. The Antichrist has already come. That there are some people now, if you check their, the button of their shirt, you will see, 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 see there. If you check, uh, you know, you, that. and the problem is once you get the Antichrist, you will never be able to be born again, again. That that's the end. Ah, so I'm like, ah, you mean there is a realm you can get where you will not be born again? What are these people talking about? They say, even if you check, in those days, there used to be one sugar called Boshan sugar. It has 666 and all those stuff. There was a button of some shirts, you see. But we, as a nominal people, we didn't know. I say, ah, Abi, I'm already in Antichrist. 
ah, that may be, I'm already that. And I ran into my room, and then it was this wise man bank with UBA, I would mention, which be UBA of the 80s, early 90s. So I went into my room. I used to use this UBA there with passbook to check my account, and I saw zero, zero, something, something, six, six, nine. When I saw the first and the second, six, I'm like, ah, and that was just it. I said, Ah, God, I, I want to be born again. No, I don't want to go to hell. No. And that was it. And the next day, I just went to fellowship. And when they say you want to give your life, I just came out and gave my life to Christ. But that was my first experience because giving your life to Christ because you are afraid of God or you are afraid of hellfire, it's a level, but it's not the ultimate. It's better to surrender to God because you have discovered him as a God of love and as a God that you love. And that happened for me a little over a year after this particular experience. And I discovered God for myself as a God of love. And that happened because after I got born again, um, I was still this rising and falling kind of Christianity. And I used to say then, because I see a lot of people say, ah, but this one too says he's a Christian. He's doing this. This one says she's a Christian. She's doing it. Because in those days, I used to have some girlfriend that were in the fellowship. And they would sleep in our room in the night. And from our room on Sunday morning, they would go to the fellowship to go and do choir. So I'm like, hey, people are contouring. People are just deceiving yourself. But when I had that encounter and I continued in that rising and falling, God told me, if everybody is fake, why don't you be the original? Why don't you prove that? That, that I can raise genuine people. And I'm, wow. So that, that's when I began to understand what it means to like have an encounter with God because he was speaking to me, say, look, okay, this one is fake, that one is fake. Do you want to join the fake? That's why don't you be the proof that I can raise genuine people? And you know the way this God works, situation and circumstances, we just work together. I got to the fellowship um, maybe that same week or the week after, and then they just made an altar call that if you are here, you are born again, and you are rising and falling, and you are tired of rising and falling, and you want to live for God, rise up on your feet. I stood up. And then they told one man, what, you know, oh. one of our schoolmates, they told him that he was the coordinator, that he should go and pray for us. So the guy took us into one room, woman of God. The guy did not need to pray. When he started speaking, it was as if I had an insight. He said, are you people not tired? He said, I'm a student like you. We are both students. And now they are calling me to come and pray for you. What is so special about me that I'll be praying for you? Are you not tired of this rising and falling? When will you also begin to pray for other people? When will you come into a place where you will never answer this kind of negative altar call? Do you know the guy did not need to pray? Right there and then I made up my mind. I said, Father, the last time in my life that I'm not for any evil altar call, as from today, I'm for you. And that was 1990. And from that day till date, by the grace of God, God has kept me. And God has helped me to be able to live for him and journey with him. So that's the Christian aspect. On the business aspect, I started out, like I said, I studied building technology and quality survey. I finished school. And then I went to work in a construction company, John Kidd Construction. I was in that construction company, but because I had now met God, I had understood God. And one thing that happened, I don't know about now, but in those days, Almost everybody that got born again on campus, all of us were like called into ministry. It's as if you are a campus, it's ministry straight. So ministry was burning inside me. And I just, one day I was, I remember where somewhere in Adia Lao, they could build in all the houses that people are seeing now. I was on the 11th floor. And I was just there. I was the foreman. And I was just sitting down there and I'm asking myself, Ulumide, you mean all the grace, all the anointing on campus, you will end up here inside this consortium something. Do you know what? I stood up and I just left. Nobody should try that. Oh, I did not resign. I did not drop letter. I just stood up and just left. And, and that was the last day I ever walked. <laughs> and then um, that was also in the early 90s. Then in 1992, I started working with Maurice Aulu World Evangelism. Maurice Aulu is an American evangelist and um, I was the director of missions. So that's why I volunteered to join them. He came to 92. Uh, that was at a church called Lateran Assembly, Pastor Tony Bakari. They did a major conference. I was there, and they needed to start their Nigerian office, and I volunteered to be a part of that. And um, so I was the director of missions for Maurice Olo from 1992 to 1995. Our uh, church started in, I became a pastor at age of, I've got born again as a teenager, I became a pastor at age of 21. 
but they just founded the ministry as a pastor today. So that's how business aspect, ministry aspect. So it's just been one step after the other, and God has been faithful. Wow, awesome. <laughs> what a journey. This is amazing. Thank you very much, sir. You are leading minister of God with an incredible passion for wealth creation and marital success. If you can just talk about these two separately, one after the other, so I will not need to interrupt you. Why did you become a relationship expert? Or why are you so passionate <laughs> about wealth creation? Because when I got one in 78, the whole world, <laughs> Jesus, you know, and all to be only yeah. a number of things afterward. But I see I've ministered for you before, I see you in business and all that. I'd like to talk about these two okay. aspects. Then I might even ask, okay, you, someone to interrupt you if you can just chip it in okay. to meet your wife, you know. Okay, I okay, so so let me start you. from the relationship aspect. Ah, uh, my life has been a roller coaster of grace. Now, um, when I left school, because I was already a minister of the gospel, I, I graduated and left school already as a minister because, you know, campus life in those days, we were already, we had about 700 plus people in our school there. So many of us left school believing that, oh, we are men of God and we are pastoring and we, we didn't understand that that was just an aquarium. <laughs> so we came, I, I came out of school, uh, became a part of a church. Uh, I was in First Square, then I was in Latter Rain, um, then I had a stint at World Mission Agency that later became Glory Christian Center, as James. You know, so I had all those experiences, going to school, coming back, going to school, coming back. But when I finished school, I joined a church called um, Solid Rock Assembly. Um, that was also in the 90s. And when I joined that church, um, I became a part of the leaders of the Singles Fellowship. So I started a singles forum, which was we were meeting once every month in the school, in the church. And then somewhere along the line, it just occurred to me that, you know what, we need to do something for young people. So we started a beach outreach. And this beach outreach, we do it every Easter Monday. And we're gathering five, 600 people in those days in the 90s. We take them to Badagri Beach and we'll do that. That was moving on. I began to get the invitation to this. And, and one thing that I later come, came to realize is the fact that being anointed, being a great man of God, does not equal to marital success. The, the fact that you are anointed, you are a Bible, shamba, 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 in order for you to succeed in relationship, you need to go beyond Bible knowledge to relationship knowledge. And that was where this issue of um, relationship went to another level because I've been doing that before I got married in 1997. But when I got into the relationship I got into and then got married in 1997, I realized a lot of things that were like reality wake up call. It was like a wake up call because as someone that got born again as a teenager, I've been a pastor since I was 21. So I can say that at that point in time in my life, I was a naive Christian that believe that everybody is born again, everybody in church is good. So just serve God, everybody is serving God. I never believed that people could be in church and be having some dangerous thoughts. And then when I got uh, into honest, as he said, look, I'm pastor in a church, 100 members, so I've written a few books, my future is bright, but I don't have all the money so that I will not get married now, be asking for it. He said, no, 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 I love you the way you are. I love you the way you are, I love you the way you are. And I did not realize, so I fell for that trap. I didn't realize that I love you the way you are does not mean I love you to remain the way you are. <laughs> there is no romance without finance. And I got into a of all kinds of abuse, physical, verbal, all manner of, it was, it was a terrible experience in my life. And I was like, God, I, I've been born again since I was a teenager. I've never lived in it. I don't, how did I enter this issue? So it was that personal struggle. And you know, the way church people do things, they package a lot. So everybody will just be packaging a bit oh, as if all this. I mean, I'm not into packaging. I say it the way it is. So I saw that, ah, Omo, if that we're already teaching people marriage, people are already seeing you, <laughs> you are going through this, you need to go and help other people. And that was what led 
is a ministry. So of my misery. The ministry to relationship to families was born my own personal struggle, my own personal failure, my own realization that being anointed and being honest. Honesty is not enough. Sincerity is not enough. Hope is not a strategy. Only one person cannot make a relationship work. And that was how I started teaching people. And I was doing that. And around that time also, I'd already started going to campuses. So I go to campuses. With, I remember in 1994, 95, 96, we took the jam prospectus. And I started going around the campuses all over the country. So I was doing a lot as a young person. But the relationship thing really came away in 1990. I got married in 97. So by 1997, when I started facing those crises, by 98, I, 97, 98, I knew that I need to do something to teach people. So that's how I started Wisdom for Singles. Wisdom for Singles started 14th of February, 1998. And God told me, go sh change the face of youth ministry and go and show people the way to do it. And that's how I started Singles Ministry and it became the largest singles ministry on the continent. I uh, remember in our there was no YouTube, no social and all those stuff. So sometimes we have database of well over 11 million people that came to Wisdom for Singles over a five year period. It was a massive all over the continent. People were coming from all over and you know newspapers, TV stations from all over the world were coming to find out this wisdom for singles. But all through that experience, as everybody was gathering 10, 12,000 people at the stadium, getting excited at what this young man was doing, the young man suffering, but using his misery to be able to help people and create a you know, platform for people not to enter into error. And that was that. The issue of finance also happened. You know, I fell to the trap of, I love you the way you are. And then, Mistake. The marriage was not a mistake, but even that you can marry and money is not a, it's a mistake. There is no romance without finance. It's a major role in relationship. The second thing that happens by 1998, February, we discover we're pregnant. My first cheat of the world and another crisis. The child was not a mistake, but getting pregnant in poverty was a trouble. Frustration of, are you a man? Are you a man? Everybody's calling themselves. If people are saying man, he that cannot take care of his ass. His, the abuse was terrible. It was like, you know, sometimes you, when people say eh, women are being abused, I say, okay, no problem. Okay. Nobody's talking about men abuse. We that they have used knife to cut us, that they have been dealt with us, but we cannot beat. And then it's only women who that people say, what are women that have been beaten and abused and messed up by other women? Nobody's talking about our own. I went through that terrible experience and that was what also gave birth to the finance aspect because I was so frustrated. And by that 1998, I, I got angry with God. I got depressed. I got suicidal. That God, ah, all my life, I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I don't womanize. I don't do evil. And now I'm now the one that is a victim of this. Where did I go wrong? And now even money I don't have. I'm a pastor. The churches, I don't touch church money. I don't, so why am I suffering this thing? And it was out of that, you know, anger that I cried to God. I said, God, why? And every question I was throwing to God, I kept hearing, who told you? Who told you? Who told you? And I suddenly realized that many of the things I believed, many of the things I practiced were based on church doctrine, church practice, church belief, Papa said, Reverend said, Bishop said, my pastor said, and for the first time, 1998, God told his son, if you want to discover any aspect of life, let me show you by yourself. And I said, God, I want to be rich. I want to know how to come out of poverty. Show me the way out. And God took me from Genesis to Revelation. Woman of God, it will amaze you to know that many of the scriptures that I was interpreting based on religion, interpreting based on all kinds of things, it was another dimension. And one of the things that God also told me to do was the fact that, okay, you want to be rich. All the rich and wealthy people on the earth, go and find out the status of their life. And I discovered that the richest person in Africa then was not a Christian. Richest person in Europe was not a Christian. Richest person in North America was not a Christian. South America, not all the continent. The richest people were not born again. So God began to ask me, if all the rich people are not born again, and 
you want to be rich, does it mean you have to be an unbeliever to be rich, or does it mean I can't prosper people? And God began to help me understand that, look, I am the creator of all, but the savior of some. And as a creator, I have put principles in place for my creation to enjoy all that I have created. The principles has nothing to do with religion. The principles have nothing to do with your beliefs. It's a principle based on my sovereignty as a creator. And whosoever obeys the principle will get the result of the principle. In order for there to be procreation, I put in a principle of consensual sex within marriage for procreation. So if a mad woman and a madman have sex, whether they pay tight or not, whether they pray or not, whether they believe me or not, they will be pregnant. If a Muslim sleep with another Muslim, they will be pregnant. Pregnancy is a law. If a Muslim sows seed in the ground, the seed will germinate. If an atheist sows seed in the ground, the seed will germinate. So God made me say, son, life is governed by principles. But you are trying to mix things up because there is a difference between the person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus. The person of Jesus gives you peace. It gives you eternity, gives you salvation, gives you eternal life. But it is the principles of that prospers you here on earth. So what has happened is that the church has embraced the person of rejected the principles of Jesus. The world has embraced the principles of Jesus, even though they have rejected the person of Jesus. So they are enjoying heaven on earth on their way to hell. We, we are going through hell on our way to heaven. But God wants on earth and heaven in heaven. And within eight months, I went through lots of biographies, all the rich families of the world, all the millions, people that have been rich for 300 years. I studied their life and I discovered that every rich man, every rich woman, every rich family, there are some common threads that are equal in all of them. And I decided that if I do what they do, I'll become what they became. And that's how I did things. And within three years, my story changed. And I'm like, so I did. It became a mandate. Go teach my people how to create wealth. So right, apart from my major ministry is focused on relationship, finance, and leadership. And it is all about helping people to be able to know that in order for you to succeed in any aspect of life, you need to be educated in that aspect. And you need to act on what you know in that aspect. And that's how you become successful. So that is um, how the marriage team came up. So the marriage team was more of a ministry, but of my misery. I've been doing it before I got married, maybe to understand the importance of it more. And then that was like a major issue. And unfortunately, after almost maybe about eight, nine, it didn't, we didn't celebrate 10 years anniversary. I think about, well, well, from day one, it's been one, but unfortunately, that marriage ended in divorce, and it was a, it was a marriage blessed with two wonderful children, and um, that marriage ended, and it was one of the, it was parts of the journey of my life, but God is a faithful God. That was like a school for me, and um, I learned so much, and I came out of that, and seven years later, I said, I want to honor you, and he blessed me, and gave me a second chance. And I met my wife. So God has been here today. We have another, we have three kids all together now. Two from the first marriage and from this marriage. And it's been amazing. It's just been God all the way. Wow. Wow. Personally, I'm giving you an ovation. I wish I could just find out to give you this ovation. Oh my God. You are a blessing. A massive blessing. And uh, let me say this I don't call that a dark at all. It was a soft candle. In fact, a very bright one because it was a big blessing for us. Maybe it was a blessing for us. So it's not a dark spot. And thank you so much for being vulnerable enough to share this with us. Uh, if I ask you the next question, let me, because you told us this. Um, What's your advice to people that are going through domestic violence? Now, the focus is always on women. Hey, he, uh, you know. There are men that are going through this, like the white okay. people. Please speak to them. 
Now, one of the things we need to understand is that hot people hurt people. A lot of us are products of our background, our upbringing, and our experiences. And more people don't realize people that we call abusive, they are people that are imprisoned their emotion, imprisoned to their own personal experience, and they are like people that are in chains looking for a way to break free. And so let me say this. Any man that is an abusive man is a man I can tell you for free. I've done my research. I've done studies. Celebrated 33 years in ministry. So I've been around for a while. And I know what I'm talking about. A lot of Christians have mental health issues. And most of the time, we think that just because we are born again, that prayer will take care of everything. But that's not true. There are situations and circumstances in life that don't require prayer alone. It needs therapy. Some people need psychotic counseling. Some people need to go for real psychological therapy. Because there are people that are going through a hurt and a pain that they have been imprisoned in. So many men that do all this abusive stuff, they are in prison. Many women, they are in prison. And they are just lashing out. They are, they are, you know, for instance now, I have a wound. Let's say I have a wound on my rib. Nobody will know there is a wound. But if for any reason you hug me tightly and touch my rib, I will react. You are hugging me. That hug is supposed to be an act of love. But because I have a wound where you and you'll be like, yeah, but I'm loving you. But why are you reacting? It's because I am wounded. I am not healed. So people of their past. Or else you are going to have to make your next to suffer for the sins of because you have not been oh, if you don't heal, you are going to become a time to hurt people. So for women, if you are not healed, be healed going to a relationship. And if you know that you're here to resolve, make sure you seek help, seek counseling, seek prayer, seek the right kind of therapy that will help you. And if you are a man, you are in an abusive relationship, one thing you never do, never raise your hand against a woman. Let it be that you were abused, but let it never be on record. You try to beat a woman, raise your hand. It's two wrongs never make a right. It has never happened that two wrongs. So if you are a man, seek help. Seek help. I remember in those days, it was like, ah, what is wrong with you? Boy? I know one of the challenging things that man, Christianity, do you know that I, I could not comprehend how somebody they can pray three, four, five hours a day and still not be okay character-wise. I don't know how somebody can pray for hours and your character attitude is not it. I couldn't comprehend it. Because I'm like, ah, is the prayer not supposed to change you first before it now changes your situation? But then I came to realize that, look, people can be spiritual giants and they're emotional dwarfs. People can be spiritual giants, but they are physical dwarfs. Whatever you give at attention to is what we grow. So if you give attention to your spiritual life, your spiritual life will grow. But if you don't give attention to your soul, to your, it will become a dwarf of an emotional intelligence is lacking in the life of many people. They are very good, good spiritually and that's a little thoughts in your head. When you meet them on an intellectual level, they can't stand. When you meet them on an emotional level, they can't stand because they have not given the same attention to developing those other aspects of their life. So for me, anyone that is abusing someone that are in prison they need help and anybody that is being abused don't ever keep quiet all these say uh, they are like that part into your relationship is old school thinking god didn't say that no relationship can survive without party just be sure that the third party is the right third party a mature third party a third party that cares that can help you because anything to not solve we need somebody else to come in objectively to help us. So any problem you are going through, don't hide it. Bring it out so that other people can come and help you and you will not be a negative statistic. Oh my God. 
tonight is something else. So. Ah, without pain, this is a seminar. <laughs> Thank you, dear man of God. People are asking different questions, different kinds. What about the man that uses his, the part of his wife to abuse her? What about the, you know, different different questions? If your husband your spouse is cheating, you want to put in a word. Well, one of the things we need to understand is that when you get married, you are getting married to the past, the present, and the future of whosoever you get married to. You are getting married to the past, the present, and the future of the person you get married to. The past of whoever you are getting married to, some of the past you know based on whatever they have told you. The present you know based on what they show you don't know. So most of the time, the reason why a lot of people find themselves in this kind of situation lies that a man can be physically matured, biologically, but that does not mean he's emotionally and mentally mature. And when a man is using your past against you, he's not to do that. But, but sometimes, when we are giving information to people, we also know you are in love. You say, oh, tell me about your past. You say, I can handle you. Just begin to worry. Pa, 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 pa. I am a prostitute since abortion. I am begin, you just begin to pa, pa, pa. You, you share everything that you, you think the guy can handle it. And then the guy say, he say, are you okay? I'm okay. And then later, you begin to throw it. So we also need to be wise because truth is constant. But the way truth is presented also matters. So I can say, for instance, okay, so let's say I gave, I, I went to a place. And the place I went to, um, a million naira, I can come and say, oh, a million. That's true. I can come and say, oh, that place I went to, I got more of six figures. That's true. I'm not lying. It's the truth. When I say six figures, it's the truth. But that truth is presented in two different ways, two different realities. So whenever you are story to people, stories that can be used against you when people are not matured enough, present it also matters. And let us also make sure that whatever we are claiming to be our past is really our past. So if something is really in your past, your present state will not reflection of, of what you claim to have been delivered from. So by the time you claim to have been delivered from something, you know, ah, I used to be a king. I used to take Caring, and then now you are smoking. You are still in the same category. <laughs> because if we are still seeing you smoking, we will not say, ah, you have started again. That's how you used to smoke heroin. So it's not for anybody to use anybody's past against them. But I just we should also be wise and be sure with our mature enough to handle our truth. My God, this is so much. Thank you, Lord. You are so deep. And we are grateful to God for the wisdom of God on your inside. Based on the work you do, you are raising an army of wealth creators. How do we become financially free as a people? Christian, Muslim, you do hate head on that spot. Let's see. Okay. Now, one of the things I've come to realize is that, um, like I said, there's a difference between the person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus. And a lot of Christians are more of religious believers not kingdom believers. Christianity is not a religion. It's a kingdom. Yes, Christianity is a relationship with your creator. When you practice Christianity as a religion, you get into trouble because religion is more dangerous than the devil. So when people come into church and they practice Christianity as a religion, then they become one-sided. And I keep telling people, the supernatural is one of super plus natural. The super will remain super without the natural. The natural will remain natural without the super. It's a combination of the super plus the natural that produces the supernatural. So when we got born again in those days, in the eight, late 80s, early 90s, that, oh, once you just get born again, full-time ministry, just serve God, God will take care of you, God will do this. And we believe that until 1998 when I had that encounter and God began to rejig my memory and show me things from scripture. Because I say to people today, full-time ministry means that ministry should be your primary assignment, not your 
only assignment. Full-time ministry means that ministry should be your primary assignment, but not your assignment. And you don't go into full-time ministry until your hands are full. In those days, people left school in year three, cast in year four, instead of finishing, they are doing time. It's not by education. Many of them, 10, 15, 20 years later, they regretted it. As a Christian, you need to understand that there is a spiritual pathway and there is a physical pathway. Now, the same God that told you to bring 10% also has principle on what to do with the remaining 90%. So if you are so focused on bringing 10% and you don't know what to do with the remaining 90%, by your financial illiteracy and financial irresponsibility, you will make the 90 and turn around to say it's the 10 that you get to be poor. So as a believer, as an individual, if you want to become rich and wealthy, there are three simple that you need to take and continue to take number one your intelligence you need to understand money because the more you learn the more you earn your learning capacity determines your earning capacity if you are not informed you will be deformed if you are not inspired you will expire if you are not updated you'll be outdated what you know is what determines how far you go information is the key to transformation so number one is financial intelligence you need to learn and schools don't teach financial intelligence so a lot of people go to school because i say to people that when it comes to education there are different chances there are three things you are either educated uneducated or miseducated a lot of understand what it means to be educated a lot of people understand what it means to be uneducated but not many people understand what it means to be miseducated. And miseducation is the real problem of many people. A lot of people have been made to believe that just go to school. And when you go to school, you pass and get certificate, get, get good grade, you will get a good job, and then you will grow. That is miseducation because they have not given you the entire picture. So you need financial intelligence. And financial intelligence is not taught in school. Over 80% of what you learn in school expires by the time you graduate. Most of the textbook that they are using to teach you in school is useless to the real world. That is why the dean of faculty of accounts is poor. That's why the vice chancellor is struggling for money. That is why the lecturers are going on strike because they only lecture. They are not practitioners of what they are teaching. Having PhD in swimming, take a swimmer. Having masters in business administration or an MBA does not make you a business person. So you need financial intelligence. You need to go into the school of personal development to understand what is money. How do I make it? How do I manage it? How do I multiply? You need to understand inflation, compound set, liability. Go into school of money, which is why I wrote the book School of Money and learn about the school of money. Now, once you have financial intelligence, which is a continuum, that number one is forever. It doesn't stop. The three things I want to share does not stop my intelligence. And the day you stop learning, you start dying. So you must continue to learn, unlearn, relearn. Number two, the second thing you need is the financial, financial plan. If you fail to plan, you have already planned to fail. Prevents poor performance. If you plan well, you will do well. Everybody has four seasons in their life. Morning, afternoon, evening, and night. The first 25 years of your life is morning. 26 to 50, afternoon. 51 to 75, evening. 76 to 100, night. Morning season of your life is for learning. So within the first 25 years of your life, you need to learn everything you need to learn. The second season of your life is for earning. That's the afternoon. It's for you to earn an income. The evening is for turning and imparting the next generation. And the night is for resting. So the second part is financial plan. You need to have a plan. You are resuming work, you plan your return from day one because there are inevitable arms in the life of every individual. You either resign, you are retrenched, or you retire. So you must plan for these three from day one. So financial plan is three levels. Ascertain your location. Where am I now? Determine where am I going to choose your vehicle. Will I get there? So A. A ascertain your location. D, determine your destination. C, choose vehicle. And the vehicle you choose determines how far. So for instance, if I want to go from Lagos to Abuja, I can fly. I can go by road. 
I can, can take a bike. I can decide to trek. The man that flies from Lagos to Abuja will arrive first, not because he's more spiritual, not because he's more intelligent, not because there are no village, there are no demons in his villages. No, because he has chosen the right vehicle. The man that decides to trek to Abuja, let all the prayer warriors in this world be on the mountain fasting. He will not arrive faster than somebody that went by air. So many of us, all these village people nonsense, something is pursuing you, this is pursuing you, is because you are not in the right path. Choose the right vehicle. If you are came to the wealthy place, every salary is a trekker. Salary will never take you to the wealthy place. You are trekking. So you need to choose the right vehicle. And that's why the rich and there is no wealthy man on earth that is a salary earner. They don't work for anybody, they work for themselves. So once you decide to be a salary earner, be choosing the pathway of arch snail and tortoise progress. Because you need to understand that salary is slavery. It's called salary. You are a civil servant. You are a servant, public servant. You are a servant. So, and how can a servant have more than this? And the final one, because of time, is discipline. Financial, it's financial, financial discipline. Financial, the boys and the men. Everything that we know to do is easier said than done. Everybody knows they should save, but are they saving? Everybody knows they should invest, but are they investing? It is that financial discipline that separates between the men and the boys. You are not safe. What you save today is what saves you tomorrow. It is that financial discipline that makes you to do what needs to be done, regardless of what we think. How will people feel? What will people still listen to that? You focus on your destiny, and that's how you are. So no matter who you are, Christian, Muslim, atheist, God is the creator of all. And as the creator of all, he has put principles in his place for his creation to enjoy the best. And whether you are born again or not, financial intelligence, financial planning, and it's only a matter of time you will arrive at the worldly place. So, the tables we brought you have shattered. They are broken. <laughs> we will talk to you with me. I'm like, one leg on two legs. I see any. Like, presently, we didn't matter how shut up. So, we just have to go and start to be building the table. What a gift of God. Thank you. Rev, thank you, sir. Can I please take you further? We still have like um, uh, 12 more minutes. Can you please speak to us about mentorship or okay. mentoring? Now, and I run a mentorship platform called the Billionaires Conclave. Um, it's a platform where I mentor high net worth individuals, organization, and nation. Because one of the understand is that principles are universal, but, but the application of those principles they are geographical, contextual, and personal. It comes in. No matter what you know, as you begin to move through life. As you begin to grow through life, you begin to eat what we call the bombs on the road. You begin to eat what we call the snacks on the road. And that's why you need mentorship. Many times people read books, start practicing, and they eat a snack, but there's nobody to call. Many times people have gone to school, they've learned principles, they start practicing it, and they eat a snack, and they, there's no one to call. So mesh that helps you to be able to have a smooth journey. is someone that has actually to intend to achieve is someone that has gone through the path that you want to go through and they know where the potholes are and like as, as a matter of fact we just concluded our annual mentorship platform where people from the u.s from the uk from Qatar conclave and one of the things that i was telling them and reminding them of is the fact that the higher you go the few pick into your life the higher you go, the fewer the people that can speak into your life. When you are poor and struggling, anybody can mentor you. By that, you are doing turnover of 10, 15 billion a year, 30 billion a year, 80 billion a year. There are a few people that are in that can speak into your life. And that's why the billionaires come to own mentorship platform so that I network people can have a place where they can be free to express billions, where they can get mature global international mentorship to help them. So I will say to everybody, you need a mentor in the aspect of your life. 
And please, for those of you that are not miss this thing, because see, many of us think that, oh, my pastor is my mentor. I'm a pastor. I've been in ministry for 33 years. But I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a medical So for my members to expect me to solve their medical problem or their legal problem, it's going to be a misnomer because that's not what I'm here for. So your pastor is your spiritual leader. But there are aspects of your life where you will need to succeed that your pastor may not have the information that will help you in that area. For somebody like me, I'm a pastor, I'm a businessman, and so I can talk to those areas. But if I'm not, I can't talk to those areas. So my advice would be that you should have a mentor for all the major aspects of your life. Your pastor may be your spiritual leader, but he may not be able to mentor you financially because he himself is still struggling with full-time foolishness. You may have your pastor as a great bishop and a man of God, but he may not be able to mentor you maritally because he himself is still struggling with his marriage. So you need to ensure that for every life where you want to be constantly, you have mentors for each of these areas so that you can grow holistically and be the best version of yourself and maximize your possibilities. My God. Uh, oh, serious matter. As we wrap this up, do you have any words for pastors or people in the Okay, well, that okay, before. Before I, I wrap it up, let me just say a few things just for people to know some of the opportunities they can take advantage of. Number one, I will advise everyone um, to follow me on all my social media platforms. Um, on Instagram and on Twitter is Olumit Emmanuel. Olumit Emmanuel. On Instagram and on Twitter. And on Facebook is Emmanuel. And then I have a lot of materials and products that will help you this book is called the school of money, money book is the bible of wealth creation it's you how to make manage and your money and serves as a blueprint for entrepreneurs and you can contact our office get the book or you go to my anywhere you are in the world www.olumidemanuel.org www.olumidemanuel.org you can buy the book there is a secure payment platform are there or you can nine four two three zero eight zero nine four four seven four two three number and a WhatsApp number, or you can send an email to our overseer at gmail.com. And then for everyone listen to me, if you are in the UK, I'm coming on top of the UK next week. If you are in US, I'm coming on top of the US in April. So next week, I'll be in the UK on the 18th. We'll be in um, London for School of Money. It's absolutely free. And then the week after, I'll be in Manchester for School of Money Summit. In April, I'll be in America for the School of Money Summit. I'll be in Atlanta. I'll be in Houston, Dallas. I'll be in Ohio. I'll be in New York. And I'm also going to be in Detroit. Six City Talk, School of Money, absolutely free. So you can go to my Instagram page, get all the details, contact the office, get the date for your own city, and prepare to be there. And if you're to me right now, you are into real estate, major, major real estate training coming up. It's called the Global Real Estate Equity Bootcamp. It's seven days fully residential in the month of July. So you contact the office, go to my Instagram details, and it will help you. So for pastors and for leaders, what I will say to you is this. The message of God is the same, but the method of God changes. So God's message never changes, but the method from time to time. You see, the syllabus has changed. The syllabus of ministry has changed. The syllabus of leadership has changed because we live in a different world from the world that you are used to. So if you are a leader, you must be open to learn. You must stay teachable. You must stay humble or you will stumble. You must understand reverse mentorship. And reverse mentorship means that you must be ready to learn from your children and learn from the new generation. Especially when you are... Because everyone is more passionate about their own generation. So you need to understand that your generation has expired. There is a new generation now. And in order for you to stay rest generation, you must go into reverse mentorship and let them teach you and let them enlighten you so that you can carry that time-tested, forever relevant word of God 
and teach it in the contemporary way because you need to carry that timeless truth and teach it in a timely way. So my message to all leaders is stay teachable and continue to learn yourself and continue to learn. Because learn, unlearn, and relearn, you will never be relevant. After your season as a footballer, you need to become a coach so that you can stay relevant in the life of the next generation. And I pray that God will help all of us that we'll finish well, we'll finish strong, we'll maximize our possibilities and we'll be the best version of ourselves. Oh my God, I'm just speechless. I was going to tell you to, and now you have done it. I wanted to tell us how to contact you, the book, the program, and others. My God, people are asking me now that I should bring you back home. <laughs> it is well, man. It's all for the kingdom. Any day, any time, I'm at your service, man. Oh, oh God. what a blessing, sir. Woo! Oh, Lord. I'm sure you have to say some of the comments, you know, and all that. Amazing, amazing. Tell us one more time your okay. social media handle. If someone from your office can type it, that would be okay. Otherwise, don't so my um, my social media, Instagram and Facebook, is Olumi Emmanuel. Olumi Emmanuel. Instagram and Twitter. O L U M I D Emmanuel. Olumi Emmanuel. Instagram and midday dot Emmanuel and they can call our office for anywhere you are in the world the phone numbers to call you can call the number do a whatsapp chat you will know where I will be in London or America for the tour in on from next week so um, 809-144-7423 0809-144-7423 or zero eight zero two nine zero seven four five eight eight zero eight zero seven four five eight eight. Now, when you call those numbers, you can chat them up on WhatsApp, and that's when I'll be in London. So next week, Saturday on the 18th is London at the Intercontinental O2 from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's absolutely free. And the week after will be in Manchester. We now start the American tour. Go to the website. The website is olumideemanuel.org. Olumideemanuel.org. And for those of you that would like to be a mentorship, you can also go to the website olumideemanuel.org forward slash conclave. Olumideemanuel slash conclave. You download the brochure, it's free. For the real estate um, training, real estate masterclass, real estate bootcamp, you go to the same website. Lumidemanor.org forward slash G R E E B Global Real Estate Executive Book. And once you do you see the brochure, you see everything. Thank you very, very much, Ma, for this opportunity and this platform. It's a privilege honor. Emmy Grace Bishop, and time you need me, I'm at your service, ma. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I can see that Bishop is smiling. I just noticed that, you know. Are your materials on uh, No, no, no. They, they can only get it on my website. I don't do Amazon. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then your that the toy information is not on your bow. Please, can you just okay. let your office put okay. it there for us? If you go on my Instagram page, you will see his handle too, you know, because I tagged him. All the, every time I posted this slide, I tagged him. And as usual, you're going to be able to re-listen to this particular um, show, this recording on my YouTube page. It's been an honor. Oh, no. My God, tonight. Definitely, sir, you're coming back. Definitely. Uh, thank you so very much for being a blessing to us. Listen to Chief yes, Pastor Adelie. Maybe next time. <laughs> That's how your wife <laughs> that's another that's another dimension. Next time we'll talk about kingdom so that we understand kingdom living. <laughs> Thank you. You are so religious, you know. My husband is a bishop, like all of you know, when full time ministry, he's a businessman, he's a how many do I want to call, you know? He's selling a person at his job. Now he has his great house, he's chicken. 
sick now, but the man is monitoring monitoring everything. Hey, the times have changed. No one put time foolishness. Woo! We need to close. Thank, Thank you, you again, sir, for being a blessing tonight. We just thanks. Appreciate you. Thank everybody for joining me. My global family from around the world. I see all of you. So next week, Tuesday, please stay blessed. Remember, every 